SK Hynix hypes HBMs, Aviatrix firewalls containers, Cumulo chills out, HP amplifies AI PCs, no more internet under the sea, and a vast view of some new technologies in this week's episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I want to welcome you to this March 13th episode. We're just two days away from the Ides of March. And of course, it's uh, National Good Samaritan Day. Or if you're from Alaska, it is a national holiday because it's National Jewel Day. Oh, wait, I think it's the other jewel that they're talking about. Speaking of which, the crown jewel of what we do here at the Gestalt IT Rundown, of course, is my co-host, Mr. Stephen Foskett. Stephen, hello again. Well, you know, Tom, it's good to be here. Uh, I would point out as well, as everyone on the rundown knows, it's National Smart and Sexy Day, too. I don't know why we would know anything about that. I mean, maybe the smart part, but the news is what's sexy today because we have some exciting things that we want to talk about. Lots of cool things going on, not only in the tech industry, but across the world. But we'll dive into that in a minute because we wanted to start off by telling you about a story that we saw Mitch Lewis over at the Futurum Group has reported on some major new investments in chip packaging coming from our friends at SK Hynix. The investment comes in the form of high bandwidth memory, or HBM. The SK Hynix HBM chips have been seeing a huge increase in demand because of the growing number of companies that have been exploring AI development. I heard that's a thing that's going on, this AI deal. Now you may wonder, HBM is critical to the operations of AI clusters because companies like NVIDIA have been consuming a lot of HBM to put it into GPUs and NPUs and all kinds of devices that need all of this to do all the inferencing. The company has already announced a 12-layer HBM solution, and looking forward, they have even more complex technologies out there that they're just waiting to develop and sell to all of these AI-hungry companies. Stephen, as the host of Utilizing AI, How big of a deal is it that SK Hynix is going to be doing this major investment in HBMs? Well, I'd say that it's a big deal for SK Hynix, of course, because they are probably going to sell a lot of this stuff. But they were already a leader in HBM memory as well. Um, They compete with companies like Samsung in this space. Um, Essentially, HBM is kind of what it sounds like. I mean, it's RAM, memory chips, but they're optimized for high bandwidth. Surprise, it's right there in the name. Um, essentially, a lot of modern uh, compute requires a lot of memory, and AI requires a lot of memory. Um, that being said, if that memory is on the other side of a bus and used for general purpose, well, it slows everything down, and it can idle these precious processors that you've uh, and GPUs that you spent so much money on. So what we're seeing is a new wave of GPUs, and, and actually I should mention CPUs as well, both Intel and AMD have delivered CPUs with integrated HBM as well, that move the memory a lot closer. They have a lot more ban- bandwidth, which means that they can pass a lot more data more rapidly back and forth between memory and CPU, which means that these amazing processors that we've developed can do all the things that they're supposed to do. Specifically for, H, uh, for HPC and AI, what we're seeing is a lot more um, models that use more data. And so if you can get more memory right there on the GPU device, then you can get a lot more done. You can use a bigger data set. I mean, you've probably noticed that people are talking about billion parameter models, multi-billion parameter models. Um, you know, in order to fit that stuff in memory in a, and, and optimize the processing, you need more high bandwidth memory. So essentially, it's no surprise that uh, SK Hynix is investing here. I would put out that, uh, point out, though, that there's been some news as well from some of the other producers of HBM that they've had some struggles getting to market with their next generation HBM. And that actually could be good news for SK Hynix as well. Essentially, anyone who can deliver this stuff um, at volume, at scale, at a reasonable price is going to walk away with a big bag of money. And so we'll see uh, how this all shakes out, but definitely the market for HBM is very bright. Cloud networking startup Aviatrix announced a new distributed cloud firewall for Kubernetes this week. The goal is to help simplify communications between clusters and workloads, as well as ensuring everything stays secure. The new firewall is in the Aviatrix cloud networking platform to allow organizations to deploy it effortlessly especially when combined with hybrid deployments uh, where applications are not uh, able to be ported to Kubernetes. Now, we've heard a bit about this previously at uh, field day events, or Aviatrix generally, 
But Tom, you're our networking and security expert. What do you think of the Aviatrix firewall? I think it's a great leap for Aviatrix because one of the things that we see a lot in the cloud networking space is that it's not just plumbing that network. I mean, let's be honest, if Amazon or Microsoft had built a cloud environment that didn't have any solid networking in it, you probably wouldn't need to uh, you know, do anything with that cloud because nobody would want to buy it. But solid is not fully functional. And I, I go back to the reference of the network that was in the ESXi hypervisor when it first launched. Yeah, it was the network of all time. And that was about all you could say about it. And it took a long time until they could even get it functional to the point where it would integrate with a lot of other things. Flash forward to today, where you have all of these networks that are running through, you know, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, what have you. And for Aviatrix, there is a huge opportunity here because as we've seen in the past, they do a lot of things to help make that networking easier, especially when you're talking about doing it between a lot of different regions or things like that. But you have to have security integrated into that whole process. And so now what they're saying effectively is we're going to allow you to firewall down to the container level. That is a big step forward for companies, especially in the regulated industries that are looking to move into the cloud, because one of their biggest concerns is how do you meet all of those regulatory guidelines when all of your data is just sitting out there, freely accessible to anybody in the world? Well, we do it the same way we did when the internet didn't have NAT boundaries and everything was freely addressable. We provide ways to ensure that network paths don't extend too far into whatever we're talking about. And in this case, it's the applications. Because as you noted in the, the opening of the story, there are some apps that are never gonna be able to be containerized. They are just too monolithic. They require too much special sauce, if you wanna call it that. Or there's no value in containerizing them, but they still need to be protected, especially if they live in the cloud. So by providing a containerized firewall that can kind of jump in front of it and say, okay, you know, we're gonna limit access to maybe like just front end to back end conversations, or, you know, maybe air, uh, servers in this pod can talk to it, but nobody else, that's hugely valuable. Not only that, but because of the way that these devices and these systems provide audit logs, it allows you to be able to pull reports on demand, for lack of a better term, to provide to your auditors to ensure that you're not running into, you know, regulatory concerns. So you get peace of mind that everything is protected. It's easy to deploy. So you're not like trying to nail up a whole bunch of crazy firewalls that don't all work together. And you can provide reports that prove that it works. I, I don't see a problem with this. And I think that it positions Aviatrix to compete with a lot of the other companies that are in that space in the market right now. Uh, we've covered a number of them on the rundown in previous episodes. So I'm kind of curious to see the direction that this takes Aviatrix, because I know they're kind of on a path to, to grow a lot in 2024 and beyond. And I think this is a good step forward to make sure that that happens. Cumulo has announced a new cold data storage service that is cloud native for Azure users. They say that the goal is to have their services available for any customer IT environment, whether it's on-prem all the way up to the public cloud. The solution, which they are calling ANQ Cold, is integrated into the Cumulo global namespace. That means that users can access the data anywhere that they have access to that namespace, whether it's remote or local, on-prem or in the cloud. The CTO, Kiran Bagashpur, says that ANQ Cold is great protection against ransomware, is a very affordable archive solution, one of the most affordable on the market. Stephen, I know that a lot of companies have started getting into cold storage in the cloud. What is your take on this? Yeah, and, and I think that the cold storage aspect is the thing that caught my attention with this story and why I wanted to talk about it. So. Um, you may not be familiar with Cumulo, or you may if you've watched Tech Field Day because they presented a couple of times, but essentially this is a company that's delivering a great uh, hybrid cloud uh, scalable uh, NAS with a global namespace. Now, there's a few companies that are out there touting similar features, and that's okay. Um, Cumulo has specifically zoomed in on um, this, uh, basically uh, providing storage for critical applications that have uh, sensitive data. So one of those applications is called PAX. That's a very popular way of archiving and, and communicating within especially hospitals and other sort of regulated industries. 
And um, this cold storage solution is specifically targeted at that kind of data set. In other words, um, the same kind of data that is targeted by ransomware. And so this is actually a, a really nice solution, I think. I could see customers really being excited about this, especially if, as suggested by Cumulo, it is cost competitive with tape because tape is really where a lot of this data is stored today. But of course, that makes it a little less accessible. Um, having it in the cloud potentially allows it to be accessed from multiple locations with a global namespace like Cumulo offers. And it would basically enable these systems to be a little bit more protected thanks to features that uh, Cumulo and, and other products have. So I, I like this idea. I like the whole concept of cold storage targeted at specific applications. And also, of course, um, it's very important that we're talking about a system that's integrated with the cloud, which will hopefully uh, match the way that workforce and, and workplaces are done these days, you know, where you've got especially hospitals that have multiple locations increasingly, uh, you know, insurance companies, a lot of these um, organizations out there um, that have uh, data in multiple places and would benefit from not just a global namespace, but also cold storage and cloud storage. So all in all, I'm um, really excited about this. Uh, it seems like an interesting solution for the market and um, look forward to talking to Cumulo more about it. The German Ministry of Defense faced some harsh criticism this past week as a WebEx call between high-ranking military officials and other government employees was released by a Russian news outlet. The uh, content of the call had created a political firestorm, but it's also called into question how the call recording was obtained in the first place and why it wasn't more secured. According to reports, rather than the stored call being obtained through hacking, it was due to an insecure phone line. One of the call participants was in a hotel room in Singapore and dialed into the call from a landline phone instead of using his WebEx app. Tom, uh, we're dealing with this environment where there's a lot of stuff being done in these applications. They try to make it friendly and accessible by offering all sorts of different ways to connect. Does this open security concerns? It does quite a bit, and there's a reason that people have to be aware of this. Okay, so I'm just going to set aside all the geopolitical part of this because I don't care about that. What I care about is what happened here, and it is a perfect example of allowing an application to fail open. Um, you may have heard this a lot. You know, when an elevator fails, it fails closed because it doesn't work. But when an escalator fails, it fails open because it becomes stairs, right? In this situation, you really want the application to fail closed. If I try to access this platform through any kind of system that is not secure, I don't want anybody to be able to join because what exactly what happened is that they had set up this WebEx call and WebEx does have encryption functionality. But as soon as somebody tries to enter the call that doesn't have the ability to do that encryption, it well, if you read the, the, the guidelines, it says it may impact the encryption capabilities of the call. What it really means is we can encrypt this call because the app, we don't have a way to dial that in. Now, here's where it gets interesting. So first of all, Cisco's comment was we don't comment on users. You're going to have to go talk to them, which is the right answer for this. But there's a flaw in the way that WebEx works you do not natively have access to landline dial-in capabilities in WebEx. Go out and download the free WebEx client and start a meeting and then have somebody try to dial in. You can't do it. And there's a reason that is actually very practical. Phone lines cost money. They always have and they always will. If you wanna provide a phone dial-in for a WebEx meeting platform, you must pay for it. So we know that the German Ministry of Defense was paying for this. Why is there not a button that says disallow phone dial in? Why is there not a button that forces people to use the app? Because that would have stopped this problem. First of all, to uh, I believe it was a general. Why in heaven's name are you sitting in a hotel room dialing into a meeting? you should have your government issued laptop connected to the hotel's wi-fi through at least one vpn and then you connect to an encrypted call don't do it any other way and so effectively what happened is, is that allowed him to have his phone tapped and, and and that's the other reason why don't ever use a landline for any kind of secure communications those phones are very tappable and i know this because i used to deploy 
phone systems in my previous job and getting those things to be TLS encrypted was such a nightmare that it wasn't worth the effort. So that's what's going on here. We need to have systems that fail closed for certain applications. Yes, this general would have been very upset that he couldn't be able to dial into this phone. And then someone says, well, why don't you just use the WebEx app on your iPhone or whatever you're using or get your laptop out and do that because it's a better solution than having all of your dirty laundry aired to the entire world because you wanted ease of use instead of security. And I will beat that drum all day long. Uh, I literally just wrote about this uh, this week on my own personal blog about how there needs to be a certain amount of friction in security so that users know they're secure. Because when you make it too easy, everybody just assumes that they're secure and they're not. So, you know, we're going to be dealing with a political fallout of this for a long time. But Cisco, if you're listening to this, go put that button in there so that nobody can dial into an ultra secure call from a landline and you won't have this problem in the future. Plain and simple. HP held a partner event, Amplify, last week, and some of our colleagues from the 6.5 Media were there to see how their company is advancing PCs and printers, aligning the connective tissue of AI to enhance hybrid work, and a lot of other things. The coverage highlighted collaboration between Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, and Intel, and how HP is positioned to compete in the evolving market. Of course, there was also a lot of talk about the approaching AI PC wave, though we anticipate very fierce competition in the market with Apple as kind of that dark horse sitting out there since we don't exactly know what they're going to be doing. Steven, you've talked about the AI PC before on the rundown. What's your take on HP's client compute message coming out of Amplify? I think this is really key, um, but first let me make it clear that we're talking about HP, not HPE. In case you forgot, uh, HP, Hewlett Packard, split into two companies. Uh, one of them is focused on the enterprise, that's HP Enterprise, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, the other company is HP, which is, I guess, the HP that uh, you'd get at Staples, basically. It's, uh, it's PCs, it's printers, it's telecom, it's collaboration, it's software, it's all sorts of things on the client side. So HP Amplify is their partner conference where they debuted a lot of their messaging, in, which is an important aspect here, as well as products for their partners. Um, and of course, HP is a very, very powerful company on the client space. And of course, this is a company focused on AI PCs. So certainly a lot of people like to joke about um, HP being focused on printers and selling printers as a service and all that. And there was a lot of talk about that. And, you know, the pros and cons of that are, well, pretty obvious. I mean, it's the same pros and cons of sort of everything as a service. Um, you know, I can understand why people object to having a printer as a service, but I can also uh, understand why people would want a printer as a service because then they don't have to worry about it. And printers are kind of a hassle normally, so it takes a lot of that away. Uh, but let's zoom in here on the AI PC, because to me, that was a huge takeaway. As we've talked about before, um, most of the PC makers uh, in the market are looking at ways of uh, get, basically getting on board with the AI wave because the software vendors, um, principally uh, companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, are building AI-enabled uh, applications that end users are craving. Uh, Apple is a dark horse in this race as well, since Apple makes a vertically inter integrated PC that goes all the way from literally processor design up to end user software. Uh, Microsoft is probably the, the main competitor here and the, and the linchpin on which the success of the AI PC stands, because essentially if Microsoft can develop a uh, AI enabled version of Windows that really brings valuable technologies right down to the client device, then the client devices are going to need to bring some serious hardware to back that up. And that's going to make every company in the industry smile from vendors like HP and Dell to chip makers like Intel and AMD and Qualcomm and um, uh, supporting component makers like companies like Samsung and SK and Micron and Solidime and all the rest of them. So essentially, that's what was on display at HP Amplify. Number one, uh, the fact that they have developed 
PCs and essentially AI workstations that can really do quite a lot of local processing, which uh, reduces costs. You want to gripe about everything as a service, gripe about your cloud service bill if you're paying for uh, open AI and things like that. Um, brings that right down, uh, processing locally, basically, you know, for free as a CapEx uh, on your local machine. Uh, they demonstrated this uh, in partnership with basically all the companies that I've just mentioned. And they've shown that you absolutely can do HP pro or uh, uh, AI processing on an HP end user client device. But more importantly, they stood up there on stage with basically everyone in the industry to say, yes, we're really doing that. And by that, I mean, you know, they, they stood on stage with partners from Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, Intel. And it's really amazing to see those kind of people sharing the stage with a company like HP and all in sync, all banging the same drum that the AI PC is real. They're going to deliver it on a hardware front. They're going to deliver it on a software front. They're going to make this thing happen. And this, I think, is really transformative for our industry. I know there's a lot of concern about all of this AI processing being done in the cloud. And I think that there's good reason for that. As I said, for one thing, the operational expense of that can surprise businesses, especially if they've got paid subscriptions. They could uh, end up with another uh, cost uh, center that they're not prepared for. The other thing, of course, is that um, a lot of businesses are leveraging AI technology and they'd rather have that have the benefits of Edge that we've talked about, for example, at Edge Field Day and on our Utilizing Tech podcast, having local processing, which reduces latency of processing. Um, it allows you to process when devices are disconnected and so on. Uh, that's really important for um, edge environments like retail and industry, but it's even important for just regular people on the go. You know, you've got your HP laptop, you open it up in the coffee shop, and you're able to do the things you want to do in Windows without having to be connected to the internet. That, I think, is going to be a very powerful argument in favor of these AI PCs. Now, again, I have to say that Apple is really a, a dark horse here because we don't really know what Apple's doing. But one thing we do know is that Apple has put a lot more AI processing in their hardware. And I think that a lot of us are waiting to see where that comes to software. So we know what Microsoft and Intel and AMD and NVIDIA are doing for the AI PC. We don't really know what Apple's going to do, and we'll see. I suspect, though, and I don't think that this is a dangerous suspicion, that Apple is going to lean heavily into the AI PC era anyway. And that's essentially going to benefit everybody because not everybody's going to use Macs. And the people that don't use Macs are going to want to have the same AI enabled features that Apple's going to probably deliver soon. And that's going to give companies like HP and Dell and Lenovo and so many others a huge boost in terms of sales. I think we're going to see a massive wave of refresh of client-side hardware to support this AI PC vision that we heard about at HP Amplify. Reports came in last week that there had been some damage to several of the undersea cables that provide global internet service. Four of the cables that run through the contested Bab al-Mendab Strait off the coast of Yemen were reported to have suffered some form of damage. It has been suggested that the attack may have been carried out by the rebel forces of the Houthis that have been creating geopolitical tensions in the area for months with missile attacks on ships. Other reports stated that maybe it was caused by a ship being forced to drop anchor and drag it across the seafloor, maybe to avoid said missile attacks. Tom, um, we know the significance of undersea cables. We know that these can be uh, damaged. What's your take on this story? I think that it's... A little bit of uh, just the, the perfect storm of having the wrong thing happening in the wrong place, but also that there's a lot of factors that go into this that people need to understand. Now, just to give everybody a real quick overview, the Bab al-Mendeb Strait is basically that little teeny tiny piece of the Arabian Peninsula that's like a couple of dozen kilometers away from the coast of Africa. And that's like the entrance to the, the Red Sea, which then goes up to the Suez Canal. So, so basically, you've got this little teeny tiny part of the ocean that a lot of traffic goes through. And for lack of a short, longer story, um, people are not happy with things that are going on right there. And so right now, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Like we've had people firing rockets at ships. We've had piracy. We've had um, other nations in the world that are trying to secure the area. 
But one of the things that came out of it that's important to enterprise IT is the fact that we found out that several of the cables that go under that area uh, were damaged somehow. We don't know if it was purposefully done by uh, some of those rebel factions. We don't know if it was a ship that just threw its anchor overboard, like you said, maybe trying to avoid being attacked. Um, maybe somebody got on the ship and told them to do it. We, we literally don't know right now. All we know is that the companies that maintain those cables are saying that there was damage. Now, People are like, well, why would you run a cable across the ocean there? It's a stupid thing if there's if there's uh, geopolitical problems. Yeah, it's also several hundred thousand dollars cheaper to run that cable the shortest stretch of the length that they can. And that just happens to be the only area in that part of the world where there's a very short area of uh, undersea whatever. Also, there are specialized companies that can repair these cables. But just like any other specialized repair company, they're booked out a few months, years in advance because you have to have special equipment. You have to have a special ship that can go in and like pull up the cable and do the work and then put it back down properly. So this is one of those things where if, you know, if something were to cause it to break in half, it's not like you can just call Best Buy and have them come out that afternoon and fix it. It's going to be down for a while. Now, just like the tensions that are going on in that area have caused traffic to need to be rerouted, um, ship going traffic, if there is damage to these cables, there are other ways around it. We built the internet to survive a nuclear catastrophe uh, in the 70s. We, we have redundancy built into it. But what's happened is, is that the amount of traffic that's being pushed over the global internet now is causing a lot of those quote unquote backup paths to effectively be filled up. And now we're seeing the results of that where we are going to need to build more infrastructure to offload that um, dearth of communications. And if we can't rely on these areas to carry that, then we have to come up with a different solution. And that is still going to be months or years from being able to be built out. So I think that what we're going to see is in addition to all the other things that are going on in the area, people are going to have to be very cognizant of the fact that the communications infrastructure in that space is uniquely vulnerable. And remember, we're talking about effectively what could be considered a group of rebels that don't have very good access to advanced military hardware. In a situation like this, where you had a country that had access to things like submarines or specialized warships that could detect these cables exactly where they are, you could see a big problem in the future. So I think that these um, knock-on effects are going to be a lot more critical in the future to protect because I wrote a story years ago, years and years ago, talking about how we don't target dams, we don't target hospitals, we don't target critical infrastructure because the effect of doing that could be massive down the road and we have no way of no noticing that. Well, in today's world, you know, we've seen people target dams. We've seen um, attackers target hospitals and shut them down for ransomware attacks. So I would expect that critical information communication infrastructure is going to be on the target list next and we need to figure out how to secure it. All right, we wanted to take a closer look at a story that came out this week and it has some impact on some of our field day audience because Vast Data announced that what they are calling their AI factory was released yesterday and we did get a detailed look at it thanks to a Tech Field Day showcase. Vast is collaborating with NVIDIA, Supermicro, and Run AI to demonstrate their ability to operationalize AI at scale. Highlighting their rapid growth and their partnerships, Vast Data's architecture supports new capabilities like Vast Database and Vast Data Engine. Discussions cover integrating Vast Data with NVIDIA Bluefield 3 DPUs, optimizing Supermicro hyperscale servers, and running full-stack AI operations at Run AI. The showcase emphasized the benefits of DPUs, power savings, and strategic partnerships. It also explored the comp complexities of deploying AI at scale, emphasizing the integration of data processes and the role of Run AI in managing GPU resources. Now, Stephen, that's a lot of information to unpack in such a uh, fast showcase, but you were there and I wanted to get you to kind of start off and give us an overview of kind of what was discussed and, and what makes it important to the industry. So we're seeing a lot more interest in um, in terms of operationalizing AI in the enterprise in optimizing the AI data pipeline. 
what that means is, well, let's take a step back. You know, what is AI? What is really happening here? Well, first off, AI is a multi-step process. You have to do data collection and organization. You have to do data you know, training. Uh, you have to bring in other data sets. You have to you know, Im Im implement the, uh, the machine learning or AI-based application. Um, and you have to integrate that with enterprise data in order to have something useful. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about that this season on utilizing tech, which is focused on AI. The fact that essentially um, an LLM is really only a user interface. It's not really a knowledge engine. The best um, LLM is going to be integrated with structured data on the back end in order to provide uh, validated and valid answers instead of uh, hallucinations or you know, maybe accurate information, but maybe not exactly what you're looking for. So if we consider the LLM to be more of a user interface, then that shows just how important data is going to be at every step here. And we're seeing a lot of companies really focused on this data pipeline for AI. Essentially, um, if you're an enterprise that's trying to implement uh, AI-based applications, you have to start asking yourself, where is my data? What is my data? How am I going to organize that data? How am I going to um, move it all together, present it to by, for AI training as well as for um, the AI application itself. And that makes uh, distributed data platforms much, much more attractive. That is definitely a topic we've been hearing from, from companies like Vast Data. Um, we've also heard about this from many of the other companies in the, in the space. And I'm going to give you a, a, a quick spoiler here. Number one, go watch AI Field Day 4, where we talked a lot about this. But number two, uh, keep an eye out, because we're going to be doing an AI data infrastructure field day event later this year, where we're going to try to bring together all of the companies in this very complicated and interesting space to talk about how they're approaching this challenge of collating and presenting data to AI applications. Now, Vast is pretty well positioned in this market because they make something they call um, disaggregated shared everything storage. Essentially, they've created a storage platform that is not in one spot. It's not like this is the storage array and everybody has to talk with that. What they've done is they've created a scalable shared everything storage environment that allows uh, each element to participate as sort of a board of storage. Then they extended that with things like what they call the vast database, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a literal structured database that can run on this as well. And they are integrating that with AI applications, with HPC applications, with cloud, as well as the enterprise data center to basically make not just storage, but actual data available at scale. Then what they did is they reached out to partners, and that is absolutely critical. So this launch, this announcement, this field day showcase included three key partners from Vast. Number one, we have the elephant in the room, NVIDIA, who not only make the GPUs that are used for a lot of AI data training, especially, but also inferencing, but they also make their own um, basically disaggregated computer. Uh, we've talked a lot about the Grace and the Grace Hopper and things like that, which uses uh, ARM cores in addition to GPUs. Uh, but they also also make networking hardware, which I'm going to have Tom talk about here in a second, including uh, DPUs, which offload some of the processing work to the networking, the NIC, instead of having it all function all on the CPU. So NVIDIA is really a key here, and Vast is announcing that they are completely integrated with NVIDIA. They are going to be um, delivering the Vast disaggregated storage environment, um, shared everything storage environment. They're going to be doing that on these NVIDIA devices natively, which is super powerful. Um, and one reason that Vast is getting so much traction in NVIDIA-dominated AI environments. The next partner is Supermicro. Supermicro obviously also is a big player in the industry. They are putting together, um, you know, they're, they're the, the trusted supplier for most data centers, and they are delivering Vast um, right there, integrated with their hardware uh, for storage, for processing, et cetera. So, I mean, Supermicro um, is important. But then Run AI, this is important because Run AI is on the software side. They're talking about how this stuff really works. They're talking about um, the, the, the data capture, the data preparation, 
moving data where it needs to be, um, operationalizing this whole thing in a way that 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 really is repeatable and structured and 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 ready for practical use. So essentially, Vast has delivered a solution that looks like, if it's not already, it's going in the right direction to be an essential element of any kind of enterprise data stack. And of course, they're also beating their their drum, talking about all the wins that they've made. Uh, they're they're partnering with companies, uh, popular companies in this space to basically roll this out everywhere. And, and they've gotten a lot of industry traction. But Tom, I wanna zoom in a little bit on the question that I brought up earlier. Um, NVIDIA, networking, DPUs, um, and specifically the fact that there's not a lot of x86 in the NVIDIA picture. And, and that's really interesting, isn't it? It is. And that's one of the things that NVIDIA has really been kind of staking their claim on is this idea that they can port a lot of this to the ARM architecture. You've seen this a lot recently because NVIDIA's always kind of had their own way of doing things, whether it was rewriting your workloads to run on their GPUs using CUDA or then the networking equivalent of CUDA, which is called DOCA, D-O-C-A, that they want you to port this to their low power, uh, more simplified instruction set. You know, RISC architecture really did change everything because the x86 complications of their architecture means they're power hungry, means they really love more cores, really means they, they, the CPU needs to be doing everything. And NVIDIA blew that up by saying, well, what if we just put a whole bunch of CPUs in the system instead of a whole bunch of cores? And that's really where this idea of DPU started taking off. And once DPU started becoming a foundational element of what was going on in a system, it changed the way we looked at networking. All you have to do is go look at some of the stuff that Amazon talked about with uh, Nitro, where they're using those Nitro DPUs to accelerate communications. They're getting rid of TCP because for what their workloads look like, they don't need to do that. You couldn't do that with a traditional networking stack or a traditional x86 architecture. But more importantly, when you look at what Vast is doing, they're running their system, their AI system directly on a Bluefield DPU. That is not something I would have ever expected to see if you'd have asked me eight years ago, if this was even remotely possible, why would you wanna run all of your stuff on there? Latency, latency matters more than anything else now. When you look at all of the designs of these gigantic AI systems that NVIDIA has been putting out, it's all about trying to scale them as wide as possible with the least amount of latency. That's why they still use InfiniBand. If you want to make sure that your data gets delivered in the right amount of time with the least amount of latency, yeah, InfiniBand is king. But even NVIDIA knows that InfiniBand isn't going to be king forever. So that's why they released their new Spectrum X Ethernet architecture for doing AI communications. What is one of the linchpins of Spectrum X? Hmm, it's Bluefield 3. You have to run a Bluefield 3 DPU in your server architecture to be able to enable Spectrum X. End of story. That means that anybody who has the capability of running things on a DPU close to the workloads has a huge advantage when this architecture gets built out. And the other thing to know about Spectrum X is that it is kind of NVIDIA's future. A lot of cloud companies don't want to deploy InfiniBand because it has no real additional value beyond the customer that deploys it. They would rather run something a little bit more standard like Ethernet so that they can drive value out of it for multiple customers. They can reuse that architecture down the road. And that's why NVIDIA has kind of backed Spectrum X as much as they have. I think that they see that InfiniBand has value for certain applications, certain kind of transition mechanisms, but they really want Spectrum X to take off. That means getting more Bluefield 3 DPUs into devices so that they can kind of enable that architecture. And with companies like Vast that are building specifically to work with a Bluefield 3 DPU, that has a lot of upside for everybody. So I would expect Vast to kind of be the vanguard of having solutions that are going to run directly on these DPUs. Yeah, and if you're interested in how this all works, by the way, um, we did have a very specific uh, in-depth discussion. Um, John Mao and uh, John Kim uh, from NVIDIA discussed uh, how Vast and NVIDIA are working together to enable um, this. Just look in your favorite Google for 
uh, running uh, Vast and NVIDIA Bluefield, and you'll find the video. Uh, you can also find it at techfieldday.com. Uh, another thing I'll call out, though, is, um, you know, they Vast obviously, you know, is limited in some of the names that they can share uh, because they're working with hyperscalers, and hyperscalers don't like people knowing how their infrastructure works. But they were able to tell the Field Day community about some of their customer wins, and it's pretty impressive what's happening. Um, they, for a long time, have talked about Pixar using Vast for, uh, for rendering. Um, but, you know, we've got companies that they're able to talk to uh, in, the, in the hyperscale space, like Lambda, Core42, and Genesis Cloud that are selecting this um, solution. Frankly, if you are a hyperscaler that's trying to enable uh, customers uh, or internal customers even to, uh, to do ML training, you need a distributed data platform like Vast or some of Vast's competitors, honestly, um, in order to support that. And they're basically lining up to buy this stuff. The other interesting thing is that this market is rapidly expanding. The total addressable market for uh, AI-enabled storage is, um, is growing. Uh, we're going to have some more detailed data about that on the Futurum Intelligence platform soon. But what I'm hearing from the analysts is that um, the AI race has dramatically um, you know, influence the total addressable market for storage sales. And that's one reason that all these storage companies are diving in here and becoming more full featured. Now, I think the thing that's going to spell the difference between success and failure for these companies, though, is how credibly they're able to deliver integrated solutions with partners and how credibly they're able to deliver higher level data platform services. Um, another thing that uh, we heard John talk about at the uh, Tech Field Day Showcase was, um, for example, offering native Kafka and native Spark on the Vast platform. Stuff like that really can make a difference because number one, it's one less thing to manage, but number two, it can be accelerated by platforms like this, which makes it work way better than running it standalone on plain old storage. And I think that, that uh, things like that and the Vast database and, and so on, all of this makes it look like Vast is well positioned to succeed in this emerging AI data platform space. So as I said, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail at a future field day event, but do check out the announcements here. I think it's pretty interesting what Vast is doing. Speaking of future field day events, Stephen, we have quite a few coming up that we wanted to make sure that our audience is aware of. The first one is going to be happening April 10th and 11th, and that's Security Field Day 11. I'm very excited to be back in Silicon Valley talking about all things related to security, not just encrypted phone calls and undersea cables, but we're going to be talking to some great companies like Ariaka, Palo Alto Networks, and Index Engines about the cool things they're doing in the security space. And we have a wonderful group of security-focused delegates and analysts who will be joining us. You can check out techfieldday.com to find more information about that. And that's going to be a you know big thing going on for us in April. But May is going to be super busy, and you get to kick it off, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in May, we're going to be having another Edge Field Day event. We've talked a lot about Edge uh, even here today. Uh, we look forward to having some of these companies uh, present at Edge Field Day. I, I don't want to make any announcements yet, uh, but we will be uh, announcing who's going to be at Edge Field Day soon. And I think that it'll be some names that are familiar to folks who watch the rundown. Uh, you've got another uh, interesting event coming up later in May. You're right. Just a couple of weeks after Edge Field Day, we're going to be doing Mobility Field Day. There are a lot of companies that are really excited about some of the most recent advances in wireless, whether it's the enterprise or in private 5G, you name it. Uh, those companies are going to be participating with us at uh, Mobility Field Day. We're going to be excited to be bringing you all that great news the 15th and 16th of May. And then after that, Stephen, what have you got going on? So the end of May, uh, we've got App Dev Field Day. So this is the first time we're doing uh, this topic about uh, modern applications and application development, DevOps, SecOps, all that sort of thing. Uh, check that out at the end of May. Uh, we're already getting a bunch of companies lined up for that. And most of them are going to be new companies to Tech Field Day. So that's pretty exciting. Um, also, I want to call out that uh, the, our sister company, 6.5 Media, just announced the annual 6.5 Summit. Now, if you haven't participated in this before, it's basically a, uh, a virtual event that highlights some of the key companies in the industry. And they, they announced that the keynote speaker is Bill McDermott from ServiceNow. So if you are one of those people out there that is, um, you know, sort of in, in that level of IT, who's looking for a strategic look 
at how IT platforms and services are going to be developed in the future, definitely register to attend the 6.5 Summit. And if you're a company that's interested in speaking at that, I know that there are still uh, spots available. So uh, reach out to 6.5 Media to join that. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Remember that we do publish a new episode on Wednesdays. Uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash Gestalt IT video or open up your favorite podcast application of choice and look for Gestalt IT Rundown because that is where we will have uh, the audio transcription of this. If you want to read the stories that we have included for note-taking purposes, you can go to gestaltit.com to find that. We will be back next week with, um, you know, a little bit of Irish cheer in the air since St. Patrick's Day happens this weekend. Um, but the news stories will definitely be uh, crisp and fresh and maybe not green. Uh, but until then, for Stephen Foskett and myself and for all the great people who work here at the Gestalt IT Rundown, thank you very much for tuning in and joining us on this Wednesday. We'll be back next week with more great news. Until then, take care, stay safe, and uh, make sure you're not dialing into any encrypted phone calls.